called by the clerk, please. Chairman Swift Payata? Here. Councilor Backer? Present. Councilor Frick? Here. Council Lynch? Here. Council Mole? Present. Council Roberts? Present. And the town manager? Yep. And the town clerk? Yep. Okay, thank you. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Reports and correspondence. Is there any counselor who would like to report on anything? I see none, so we will move on to the town manager's report. Mr. McGovern. Didn't expect it that quickly. A uh, couple of different things. I just wanted to note that the council manager's charter uh, has now been in print form following the change in the election date, and those are available to the public if anyone would like to come in and uh, obtain a copy, or we can also uh, mail it out to anyone who would like as well. We also finally have printed up the uh, uh, Gulfcrest Master Plan. Maureen gave me these today, and I uh, appreciate the fact that uh, they now are available, and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, this was actually done in July 2002, but we, we, we were out of copies, and uh, now we have some nice copies in, in good shape for anyone to look at. So, uh, finally, the council has before it a draft schedule of uh, workshops and council meetings for the year 2005. Uh, we used to do these things running to the end of the, they're in the folders that you have. Uh, we used to do these things to the end of the council year and we just discovered that the council year now goes until December uh, has resulted in the charter change. So the budget schedule is, is a, looks about the same as it looked in previous years, although we've tried to clarify what are dates that things happen as opposed to dates of meetings, which used to cause a lot of confusion. And then there's also dates of workshops on the other sheet, uh, which you, you might want to look at uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, see if you see any concerns and uh, let us know about that. Could, could I ask, would you prefer that anyone who has a conflict communicate to me or to you? Whatever you'd like. To the town manager, please. Okay. <laughs> if you have any concerns, send me an email. And, uh, I'll see what we can do. The, they're very, particularly the workshop dates after June, because uh, earlier we had looked at the ones actually through May, the ones June on are very, uh, have not been looked at at all. Uh, and a, re a reminder that the first one, uh, January 4th, the next meeting, is a tentative workshop with the school board, which I think uh, finance chair uh, David uh, might start earlier. We usually begin those with uh, a dining experience uh, and then continue on with the meeting and uh, the school will be doing that again. Okay. That's fine. So we'll probably start that around 6.30 and have a bite uh, to eat and then start at uh, 7.30. And that's at the town center fire station. So Mike, should we assume that all these other meetings are at 7.30 unless Unless noted otherwise, otherwise noted. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, let's, if we have any conflicts that we know about now, let's get those to Mike with, uh, in the next week or two because that way everybody can get them on the calendars, the 2005 calendars. Thank you. Anything else? No, thank you. Okay. Um, we are at that point in the agenda where we have citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. If there's anyone who, here who would like to speak, please come forward to the podium. Seeing no stampede of citizens, we will move on. Uh, the next thing is the minutes from our previous meetings. Do I hear a motion? I would move adoption of the minutes of the meeting held on November 8, 2004. Do you want separate motions? And the minutes of the meeting held on November 10th, 2004. Second. Then moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councilor Backer. Discussion, a, a point on the minutes from our regular meeting of Monday, November 8th. 
on page four with some great embarrassment. I must point out that the reference to the seventh annual Beach to Beacon Road Race is incorrect. And it is incorrect because I referred to it as the seventh at our last meeting. It is the eighth annual Beach to Beacon Road Race. Well, you're lucky that we do not have public floggings in this town, or we would <laughs> severely reprimand you but for that you, error. The minutes were accurate in their rendition of the what The minutes they said. were accurate. <laughs> that is true. The minutes were accurate. It was the counselor that was inaccurate. So however that needs to be noted or amended, we'll assume that. Well, the motion, I believe, was made by uh, Counselor Lynch, seconded by <laughs> Counselor Fritz. So would they accept that as a, a, I a friendly would, I would amendment? accept it as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay. Is all in favor of accepting it as a friendly amendment? Okay, we've got it. So, with minutes thus amended, unless you had anything else, Council Bennett. No, I don't. Okay. With the minutes thus amended, no further discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item number 720405, we are now going to have a public hearing, uh, which will be followed by possible action on the subject of amendments to the traffic ordinance. Um, do we need an introduction to this? This is the introduction. I'll, I'll turn it over to Councillor Roberts, um, just for a very brief introduction so we can then have the public hearing so people know what we're talking about. My introductions are always brief, so <laughs> I would like to thank our council chair for uh, stepping in and actually filling in as a third member of the ordinance committee for the last two or three meetings. Uh, at one point we had uh, a conflict of interest that uh, Ann had to fill in for, and then we found the vacancy on the council, so she stepped up to the plate and was at all those meetings for us. So, having said that, the uh, the issue before us this evening is uh, was brought to us by the uh, Chief of Police regarding uh, primarily collection of uh, fines, uh, parking, parking and, other, and other moving violations, but primarily parking. The, uh, we've added definitions for a penalty, uh, which include impounding and immobilizing uh, a vehicle with a Denver boot, as so-called. The penalties, uh, the council sets the amount and the fine would double if not paid in a timely fashion, so the sooner a person paid, uh, the better off they are going to be. The chief uh, does have the right to rescind uh, a ticket given a cause, primarily if somebody was ticketed and say, the sign was down, so they had no reason to believe they couldn't park, there would be one example. Two unpaid tickets dating from December 3102, or basically the last two years, would uh, put this into effect. At that point, uh, the chief could, or his designate, could notify papers of these, of these local papers of the unpaid tickets, and as a warning to folks that if they get another ticket, they are subject to the impoundment or immobilization. And then on section D of that, if in violation, uh, again, after getting two, they may be immobilized. Uh, and a reasonable attempt would be to contact the person by phone to let them know that the car has been immobilized. Impoundment would take place if the vehicle had, was not moved within 24 hours. And before any car would be released uh, from the impoundment, all fines would have to be paid. If somebody was successful in appealing that, uh, they, would be, uh, they would be reimbursed for those costs. And the noted that they do not have to immobilize a vehicle first before impounding it. They could, if, I believe the intent of that would be if the vehicle was in a location where it had to be moved uh, due to a snowstorm or other situation, uh, that would, uh, they could just tow the vehicle away and impound it immediately. So in a nutshell, that, I believe that's uh, pretty much where we're at. Um, if anyone else wants to add to it, fine. But, uh, and the chief of police is here. I did ask uh, the chief if he'd be interested in explaining the problems that the department has had and why he brought it forward to us. So I, I think I think we should fight? do the, that after the public hearing. Um, Very well. I think that would I, the public hearing traditionally comes first. 
So if there is anyone who would like to come forward and speak on this topic, please come to the podium and state your name and your address. Is there anyone who would like to speak? I declare the public hearing open. Please come to the podium so people can hear you. I'm Brian Zavodny Show with uh, 11 Old Sea Point Road, right off the uh, Old Ocean House. I just had a question, though, as far as how much is outstanding as far as parking tickets are due to this, uh, the town of Gribble today. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. <coughs> how much is outstanding? How much uh, has not been paid? What has not been paid? Fashion? I believe the chief told us that uh, approximately 70% of the tickets are no longer being paid. I don't have the dollar figure, but it's substantial. We will, we'll ask the chief to address that as soon as the public hearing is over, okay? Thank you, Thank you for the question. Are there any uh, other citizens who'd like to step forward and speak? Well, then I declare the public hearing closed. And could I ask the chief, Chief Williams, to step forward, please, just to see if um, we can answer the gentleman's question about, and more generally, what is the current issue, um, why this was brought forward, what you see as the problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple months ago, um, I looked at uh, how we could increase revenue in the uh, town and looked at the uh, parking ticket issue because uh, we noticed that parking tickets weren't being paid and they weren't uh, the way that the old system worked for them to go to court did not or was not conducive for our court officer to be there so we found um, that a lot of people were basically just um, throwing them away or um, not paying attention to the tickets and there was no recourse that we could go after uh, on that particular um, page so um, to answer the gentleman's question um, from I believe it was uh, January of 2002. We have about $3,900 in, in unpaid parking fees. And that's, a, that's just a general um, amount. And the reason I say that is most of the parking fees are about, uh, or the parking tags are about $15. Some are higher. And so therefore, we, we didn't calculate what was higher. We just took a number and went at the lowest point. So we figured that at least we have $3,900 outstanding. So um, the person really never had a, a good um, way to appeal um, on, a, on a lower level than court, appeal that particular ticket. Therefore, in this ordinance here, we've outlined a, an appeals process for that person to come in and to state their issue. Uh, like Councilor Roberts stated, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes there are issues. Sometimes um, a person may be um, transporting a handicapped person and go down to the fort just to look at the water and park in a handicapped area, not having the tag on their vehicle. Now I think that that is a situation where we should look at that and say, look, uh, the person is handicapped in the vehicle. They did not happen to bring that particular tag along with them and look it in the mirror. Therefore, I feel that's um, reason to look at that and to rescind that particular ticket. Or in um, the case of um, Council Roberts where the sign is down, that's, that's obviously a case that we should look at that and rescind that particular ticket. Uh, therefore, we uh, instituted an appeals process. And then once that appeals process has happened, if the person still is not satisfied, then we can set up a particular court date where we could take that to court. Great. Thank you very much. Um, while the chief is before us, are there any questions for him? <coughs> Councilor Fritz. Um, Councilor Roberts said something about a, a letter going out saying that um, you have two tickets that aren't paid, therefore you're subject to, to having the boot put on as a warning. Is that something you're planning on doing? I mean, I didn't see it in the wording of the, of the ordinance. Yes, Councilor Fritz. What, what I would like to do if this ordinance is passed is look back to, um, I believe it's January 1, 2002, look at the ticket, find out who has at least two 
or more outstanding and send them a letter. Mm -hmm. After that, after those persons have received that particular letter, or it was sent to their last known address, then um, um, anything there forward would be either published on the web page or published, um, I'm sure the current might ask us or the forecaster <laughs> might ask us for those. That's how I would go, but I think there would be a posted um, issuance on the first, I, I think it's only fair to um, um, send a postage on the first. But, but you're just saying for this interim time period, yes. after that it would only be on the web page and Correct. in the newspaper. Correct. And I guess I'm not thinking that's quite adequate. I would like to see a letter saying um, that you know, you're subject to having to boo anytime if you haven't paid the bill. And, and hopefully, it would come in. Absolutely. I mean, the payment would come in, yeah, if, if they realize. But I, I don't think people will see necessarily the web page or they, the newspaper ad. You're right, they may not. However, they've just received two particular tickets on their vehicle, and I think that's notification enough. Councilor Robert, we, we actually did discuss that and part of the consideration was the amount of staff time that it would take to try to follow up on all of them and if for some reason somebody did not get the notice then they'd be, they'd be concerned that, you know, that they were being mis unfairly treated because someone or other they shouldn't be responsible for the two tickets because they didn't get that letter and it's just much cleaner just to you go out and get two tickets. Uh, it's available now to be posted in the paper, and as the chief has said, we've got several papers that would be more than happy to, to post that list on a regular basis. But typically, a person should not have to be holding two tickets. They should be paying them as they get them, and it should never be, a, should never be an issue if this works the way it's supposed to. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Lynch? Well, I, I was wondering, are we in is our discussion phase now, or are we still asking yeah. questions? You're, you're right. We, uh, are there any more Maybe questions? There are, are there any more questions for the chief while he's up here? And then I'd like to hear a motion. Okay. Do I hear a motion, Chief? You can sit down if you'd like. To. Um, do I hear a motion, Council Beck? I move the adoption of the um, amended traffic regulations, of Chapter 13 of the Town Ordinance, um, under both Article One and Article Two, as presented to us. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there council discussion now? Council Lynch. I um, first, I guess, have a question. Would you accept a friendly amendment? I'm a little concerned about having this apply to tickets that go back two years. I think that that really is a notice issue, particularly for those people who may have um, other members of their household, maybe off at college or whatnot who've gotten tickets in the last few years and maybe the parent or car owner, whoever that may be, is not aware of it. So I would like to propose that the date in uh, section 13-2-6 sub C and sub D be amended to 12-13-2004, which is today. I think that would give better notice to the public of what's at stake in terms of paying tickets. So um, I would move to amend that and ask you if you would accept that as a friendly amendment. Second. Um, sure, I'll accept it as an amendment for purposes of discussion. Okay. It's been moved and seconded, so now we're discussing the amendment. Um, is there? Councilor Roberts. Again, that was an issue that the uh, committee did discuss, and we felt that by going back only two years, that was a fair uh, cutoff date. These, a lot of these tickets and unpaid fines go back several years prior to that, and then we basically provided amnesty for the really old ones. However, to, to tell people that uh, you're getting a free ride when they should have been paying these tickets all along, we did not feel that it was fair to the people that have been paying their tickets, and there were a considerable number of people that did that as well. So I would be opposed to the amendment for that reason. Any other comments on the amendment? 
I don't view it as giving people who have outstanding tickets a free ride. I think they still have an obligation to pay those tickets, and it may well mean that we need to send an officer down to district courts and prosecute them for it, but I think that we're looking to change the penalty very substantially, and it seems to me the fair thing to do is to say penalties change, but it applies to tickets that are issued after the effective date of our action. But, but Jack, believe me, this is in no way is an attempt to say nobody needs to pay a ticket going back to 2002. I think it may mean that our police department may need to do more work in terms of collecting those tickets. So I agree with you. I don't think it's fair that those law-abiding citizens vote. We have other means of collecting tickets besides the booth. Councilor Baffert, you had your hand up. <coughs> the problem is that we don't really have a very effective means of collecting the tickets. Um, the court process is cumbersome, um, it's expensive, um, and it doesn't uh, quite seem necessary to grant amnesty, um, recognizing that the court process is not a realistic collection means um, to change the effective date or to change the amnesty date to today's date. We are effectively uh, forgiving all past tickets. I suppose the, the way to avoid having any citizens surprised by the change in the enforcement method which is really what we're doing. It's not so much changing the penalty, it's just changing the enforcement method, would be to, as a matter of policy, agree that the boot won't be used for a period of 60 days or 90 days or 120 days from the enactment date to give people a fair opportunity to come in and pay their tickets so that they aren't surprised by finding a boot on the wheel of their car. Um, publicize the enactment of the ordinance, uh, post it on the website, it'll get newspaper press, and people will have fair warning. And if people in spite of that don't pay outstanding tickets, I don't think it's an unfair enforcement means. And would they, they would be getting that letter within 30 days? Chief? Yeah, so they would be getting the letter. Councillor um, Moore. Except in the rare case of putting forward a tax break, I don't like passing anything retroactively. And I'm going to um, vote for the amendment, although I'm not going to vote for the, the boot. Okay. Any, any other comments on the amendment? Then let's move the question on the amendment to change the date. All those in favor? Of, what was? I'm sorry. What was the date? That the you date was to, today's, today's date. date. To ch all in favor of amending it, the um, language to change the date to be today's date. Signify. Aye. Two. Against. Four. The amendment fails. Um, so we're back to the original uh, motion. Uh, with the language as it is printed here in front of us. Uh, is there any further discussion on this matter? Then I, I guess I have to agree with um, Councillor Fritz. I think notice is an issue. Um, I am very concerned about this, and I, I think people often have other people drive their cars. Um, maybe someone has moved. Maybe that letter won't catch up with them. Um, Maybe their errant teenager will check the mail. I don't know. I just, I'm, yeah, or it's busy and people don't read their mail every day. So uh, I'll be voting against the um, ordinance because of the retroactivity of it. Any further comments? Councilor Fritz. I guess I, I would like to make an amendment that um, along with the note or prior to notice to the local paper and the website that the individual get a letter of warning that if they do not they have received two tickets and if they do not 
um, uh, pay, they may accept it. So that everyone, everyone from now on who, not just this initial list, but everyone now on who gets two tickets would receive a letter. I Robert, would, do you have I would like to just. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I lost track here. What, that was a motion. I said. Yes. And did I hear a second from someone? Is there a second for that? I hear no second. Do you have a lack of a second? Councilor Roberts, did you have? We're back to the original discussion. Did you have a comment on the original discussion? No, I was just going to ask the chief if he would respond to that. It was going to be seconded and passed, so it's a moot point. It's moot at this point. Any further comments? Okay, I, I just my my position on this is I will be voting for it. I think that anyone who has uh, two tickets already, even if they have a teenager like I have had, who may or may not have been throwing away tickets, so I may or may not know. I think that everyone will get a letter and I would urge the chief that if indeed this does pass is, and every and some letters come back as addressee unknown that there be some further per, uh, policy to pursue them to make sure they try to get notice to find out if those people are gone out of town or whatever but for the vast majority of people who are still in town they would receive their letter saying you have two tickets you're on the list beware come in and pay your tickets and be wary and i don't think it's fair to all the people who have been good citizens um by paying fines that they have incurred for whatever reason uh, for us to um in effect turn a blind eye to all the people who haven't been paying their tickets and uh so for that reason i'll be supporting this that's it i mean mr yeah. Mike, i just wanted to point out that this ordinance, if approved, won't be effective for 30 days, and that does give us, uh, would give us an opportunity to send the notices that this council is suggesting. Okay. Okay. All in favor of it as proposed? Opposed? Uh, I'm sorry, was that an in favor? All in favor for? Opposed? Opposed. Thank you. Uh, yes, it was F O U R, not four. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. I want to thank the chief and the ordinance um, committee for their work on this. I know that his, it has been uh, a rather lengthy process, but I know that the ordinance folks have and the chief have worked carefully to make sure that this is a process that will work well. And I expect that we will hear back from the chief on how the process is working. And we'll probably hear back from citizens when too. From the citizens. So. Um, okay, moving on. Um, item number 730405, public hearing and possible action on the BB zone front setback. The ordinance committee has recommended a proposal to reduce the front setback in the BB district. Um, Council Roberts, do you just want to introduce this and then we'll do the public hearing? This item uh, was brought, also came from the planning board. Um, to the council uh, and then to the ordinance committee and primarily the intent of uh, section 1966 and the minimum setback is to be consistent with the desire to have parking behind businesses the example that we had in front of us obviously was the inn by the sea that wanted to change the that needed the front setback uh, changed in order for them to make uh, a better entrance without having to uh, that destroy the whole property down there, but it applies to more than just the in by the sea. It affects anybody in, the, in this district uh, and will allow them the opportunity to move their building somewhat forward and put the parking in behind. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'd like to de declare this public hearing open. If there's anyone who'd like to speak on this matter, please come forward to the podium and state your name and address. No one is standing up. So I will declare this public hearing closed. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, do I hear a motion, Council, on this matter? I move for passage for the uh, item number 730405, uh, the BB zone front setback being changed from 100 feet to 50 feet. Second. 
been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Six, opposed, zero. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. We're giving Councilor Roberts a, a workout tonight. Item number 740405 has to do with an ordinance committee recommendation. Um, Councilor Roberts, would you like to introduce this briefly? I will do that one as well. And I failed in uh, at noting that our town planner is here this evening, as she usually is when we have these items on the agenda. And hopefully we'll get her to speak to at least one of these. But on uh, this item, the earthwork uh, amendment was actually brought to the town uh, by Skip Murray, Murray Construction, and the, uh, the, the gravel pit and earthworks pit as such on Fowler Road. Um, we reviewed it, uh, the planning board has reviewed it as well, and what the changes do basically add three definitions to clarify the use of the property and what earthworks are. It redefines the purpose of the property. Uh, Basically, uh, that locations that uh, have been developed in existing neighborhoods are being recognized for what they truly are and try to define them better so that we have better control. And then the standards are added that will protect uh, the neighborhood, existing neighborhood by changing the setback from a 30 feet in, in that particular zone to 70 feet away from any residential property. And so that is the ordinance that you have in front of you. I know there may be some neighbors here on that one, and as I said, the town planner can speak as well afterwards if the council needs any further clarification. Yes, this is not a public hearing on this okay. particular okay. issue the tonight. The recommendation is to set a public hearing okay. the next time. Sorry but um, do I hear a motion? I would move that we set uh, a public hearing uh, on January the 12th. Thank you. To, uh, on the uh, zoning ordinance regarding a BB district and the amendments to such recognizing the uh, earthwork uh, activities as such. Do I hear a second? I'm sorry, second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Or would any councillors like to hear anything more from Ms. O'Meara? Oh, I'm sorry. I just had a couple of questions, I think, of, of the town plan. Certainly. Okay. Could you step forward, please, Maureen? Am I um, understanding correctly that the, the zone, the other BB zone, this would be a new place, and then there's another BB zone that would be where the Inn by the Sea is? And the other one, and I'm not sure I'm reading my map correctly from the colors, would be up on Shore Road. No. no the, that, that is a BA? That's a BA, correct. Yes. Okay. So um, there's only one BA district in town right now, okay. and that's the Inn by the Sea and the lot next to the Inn by the Sea. This would create a second BB district. Okay. Um, and I guess the only place that this would be able to be the stockpiling of materials would have to be on a 20 acre site yes the the definition if you're an earthwork contractor um, and you adopt those definitions the only district where earthwork contractor is explicitly permitted would be the business b district and in the business b district there are specific restrictions on what you can do in terms of setbacks and minimum road frontage requirements for an earthwork contractor. But the Im implication is that, say, the property where the Inn by the Sea is, they could stockpile materials and... They, they could, if there was some other business in town that wanted to open up an earthwork contractor business, they could go to the code enforcement office, say, I want to open this business in the BB district. He would have to make a determination that what they're proposing is in fact a permitted use and is in fact an earthwork contracting business. And then they could open it after they receive site plan approval from the planning board. I guess I'm just wondering whether 
this is appropriate in that same district. I wonder if it ought to be called a BC rather than a BZ. I mean, that wouldn't affect what you're really when attempting to do, but it would eliminate this kind of thing from happening in another section of town that I'm not sure would be funded. Well, when the planning board first looked at this, they had three options. One was to make this kind of business a permitted use in the Residence A District. And the Residence A District is the current zoning for the facility at Fowler Road. The Residence A District covers 50% of the town, and they would have opened up 50% of the downtown to potential earthwork contractor businesses. Uh, the second option was to uh, use the BB District creation, rezone the land BB, and add additional requirements to the business B district, which is what they, they chose. The nice thing about that is that the, this, this property actually abuts the town center, and there was some symmetry to having a, a concentrated town business district in the center of town, and then a more intensive, less pedestrian-oriented business district immediately adjacent to it. The third option was to create a separate business district. And the, the planning board considered that. I believe the ordinance committee also briefly discussed it. And in the end, the decision was that they, they liked the idea of sticking with the, the business B district. There was a concern that if you created a separate district, it might look a little too much like the plot zoning for a particular business. So yes, that's still an option. You could have created a separate district. In some ways, it probably would have been better for the applicant if he had written a district just entirely tailored to them. Um, but this is the proposal you have before you. It was considered. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Backer. My understanding, Maureen, in response, further response to Councilor Fritz's comment, which there are good questions that she's raising, and they're very similar to the questions that we raised within the Ordinance Committee when we looked at this and sat down with Maureen. I understand the spot zoning issue and why we sort of steered away from that. In practical effect, with the only BB district being where the Murray operation currently is, and with the in by the sea, correct? In practical effect, there are no other opportunities for another earthwork contractor's yard in Cape Elizabeth. There just aren't any. I mean, if in by the sea goes away, which seems pretty unlikely, um, then maybe somebody could open an earthwork contractor's yard there, but that would certainly be far from the highest and best use for the location of in by the sea. Um, so in reality, Although we steered away from spot zoning, the net effect here is this is the one and only location within the boundaries of Cape Elizabeth where there's ever going to be an earthwork contractor's yard. Is that a fair assessment? I never like to say never. <laughs> well, I, I, I understand. Right. But People can be very creative. The likelihood is very small. I mean, it's a 20 acre minimum lot size. 20 acres, 70 foot setback. There's only, right now, if you approve this, there'll be four lots in the town of Cape Elizabeth that are zoned BB. At most, you could have one more earthwork contractor. And that would be? Next to the end by the sea. Right. Yeah. An unlikely spot. I don't like to predict what property owners are going to do with their property. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't see it. But again, one of the things you want to keep in mind is, you know, our, how concerned you want to be with the perception that you're writing the zoning specifically for one business at one site. You know, if someone is in that district and they can meet all your requirements, then they do, they should have the opportunity to run that kind of business. As you said, the likelihood is pretty small. Well, I, if someone will go out tomorrow I, and do it. I, yeah, I, I'd rank it smaller than pretty small. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think we can, we could discuss the likelihood, but I, I too think it's 
infinitesimal. I just don't see that people are going to want to buy property and put it in by the sea and put that sort of use there. So, um, is there any other discussion or comment? Again, hearing none. All those in favor, um, signify. Signify aye. Upsetting the, upsetting the public upsetting hearing. hearing. Yes. Yeah. Upsetting the public hearing. Say aye or raise your hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. Next, item number 75-0405 is also a recommendation from the Ordinance Committee. What have we done here? Oh, I'm 73 or four. Okay, I'd be confused there. <laughs> um, we were on, we just did 74, yeah, now we're okay. on 75. Right. I just lost my place on the page here. The, um, on this particular item, the it, it, excuse me, just for a second, Councillor um, Backer, did you want to note an abstention from this from this item from item seventy-five? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> the manager mm -hmm. had me confused there. I didn't think I didn't think so, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jack. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's fine. <laughs> I'm used fine. to it. Sure, why not? <laughs> the, uh, Please go on. All right. Uh, this item also was before the planning board, came back to council, referred to the ordinance committee. And what it is doing is clearing up the confusion that existed in the present language to allow uh, multifamily property in the uh, BA district. And uh, quite simple. It was intended all along. We've changed the language to allow it. And I, again, the town planner is here. It was a specific uh, business that was interested in this, but it's not the issue at hand, whether or not we want to allow multi-family in the BA district. And the ordinance committee unanimously agreed that that was appropriate. So we're I would here, move that um, that we set a, a public hearing for Wednesday, January 12, 2005 at 7.30 p.m. Item 750405, which would allow uh, the term multifamily to be added to the uh, BA and uh, allowed as a per permitted use in the BA district. Okay, there's a motion to set a public hearing. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I just have a question, and this is, is this proposed because of any specific development? The, uh, yes, actually, Joel Fitzpatrick had brought forward, had gone to the building inspector, code enforcement, and to do a specific project, found that under the la existing language, what he wanted to do was not allowed, um, yet in reviewing everything, it was determined that originally the intent was to allow that type of property to be developed in this, in this zone. It was just one of those things when a when ordinances get revised and changed, um, items get left off uh, unintentionally and are worded different than was ever intended. So that's what that answer. So there is, there's no pending development proposal. I'm just trying to. I believe. Understand whether there none is pending at the moment. There's none. Pending. The town planner is shaking her head no. Any any further questions? All in favor of setting this for public hearing? Six. That's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 760405 is, has to do with a um, recommendation from the Appointments Committee. Councilor Mole, you're the chair of yes. appointments. <coughs> Would you speak to this, please? The Appointments Committee has met several times over the last couple of months to look at who uh, wishes to be reappointed to their positions on certain town boards and commissions, as well as to look at openings, and we have advertised and inter for the openings and interviewed uh, numerous excellent candidates for these open positions. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is make a, uh, a motion in a block format for all of the uh, appointees and um, then give you the opportunity if anyone has an objection to a particular appointee to bring that up during discussion. But I'll make it as a block motion. And when you do that, um, I saw that we have a, a, a revised copy of this sheet, so I presume we will be talking about the, rev the revision as of today. Yes, uh, Thank you. we had accidentally left off a person from the Arts Commission that was committed that left off this particular uh, note. So please make sure you're looking at the revised version of the form. Okay. Uh, and, in, and in your packet, that was, as was handed out tonight, there were a couple of items from the Appointments Committee as well. So. All right, so let me make the following motion. Uh, I move that we appoint the following people to the following boards and commissions. Uh, for the Board of Assessment Review, Kevin Gimon. Uh, for the Arts Commission, Diane Brakeley. For the Community Services Advisory, Laura Lee Shadel. Also for Community Services Advisory, Courtney Hale Toome. Uh, for the Conservation Commission, Mike Duddy. Also for the Conservation Commission, John W. Herrick. Also to the Conservation Commission, Michael Pulsifer. To the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for three years, Charles F. Wilson. To the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for three years, Ellen Netto. Uh, to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to fill the unexpired term of Chet Rock, uh, Daniel S. Chase. To the Personal Appeals Board, Christopher Tainter. Uh, to the Planning Board, Paul T. Godfrey. Also to the Planning Board, Barbara Schenkel. To the Recycling Committee, Sarah Choi. Also to the Recycling Committee, Alina Perez-Smith. Also to the Recycling Committee, Russ Pierce. To the Riverside Memorial the rest of Cemetery, Cemetery Trustees, Trustees. Uh, Beverly Brooking. Uh, to the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, Ed Netto. Also to the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, uh, Deborah Tillman Stone. Also to the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, Mary Wiskowski and to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Jay Chatness, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, James T. Walsh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Leonard M. Galino. Uh, by the way, uh, James Walsh and Leonard Galino uh, recently filled short terms, um, so that's why they're back again so soon. This will be for a full three-year stint. Great. Thank you. And that was in the form of a motion? That was. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Is there a second? Is there any discussion? Councillor Backer? Well, I just can't help but comment that the list of names here and the experience of the people who are on this list um, is so filled with depth and competence that it's an incredibly impressive list. And I think we are indeed fortunate and Cape Elizabeth to have um, a citizenry that is this experienced and this willing to commit the time to boards and commissions that take a tremendous amount of time. Councilor. I also wanted to just comment and thank all the other people who applied and for whom there might not be a position this particular time. Um, David, uh, rightly acknowledge the depth of experience of those that are being appointed, but we had tremendous experience among applicants for whom they just, there weren't enough places. And so we're, we really are fortunate to live in a town where there are so many public spirited citizens. And I would just encourage those people to apply again. Um, we do have term limits for these positions and um, we, we hope no one is discouraged by they're not being appointed because um, we just had great applicants and 
your turn will come. So I want to thank those people as well. Great. I think we echo all, all of your thanks. Councilor Moore. I think it's also a, appropriate to quickly mention that a number of these openings, most of these openings, are caused because we have a great person serving in a position on a board, but they're termed out. And, and I really want to thank, uh, there are a couple of people right here on the list, uh, David Griffin, Kim McClellan, Alan Barthelman, Janet McLaughlin, Peter Cotter. Uh, these are all citizens who have been serving on these boards but have been termed out um, for at least a period of time. I hope they'll come back and s serve again uh, after the appropriate waiting period. But uh, I thank them for the good service that they've given to the town. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Deborah Lane, the assistant town manager who um, works with this committee, and I know she has provided great service to them. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's 6-0. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Moore. Okay, we're on up to item number 77. I would turn to our town clerk, Deborah Cabana, to introduce this. This item is reappointment of the Registrar of Voters, and uh, this is a two-year appointment. It happens every odd number year, has to be done by January 1st um, by the uh, selection or municipal officers, and I'm hoping that you will reappoint me as the Registrar of Voters. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I just want to clarify on the agenda. I recommended the appointment. That was that was my I was mm -hmm. the eye that she wasn't recommending. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> and she later on recommends herself or something. <laughs> as, as my dad always says, can't make a move without her, I know. So um, I apologize for mis turning to the wrong side. But in any event and it's a term, a two-year term beginning January 05. Okay. Councilor Roberts. I'm not sure that we had any other candidates, but Deborah has proven herself well worthy, well worthy of the challenge. So <laughs> <laughs> I would graciously like to see our most like to see her in this capacity once again. Thank you. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. Congratulations. Okay, item number 78, special election warrant. And with some trepidation, I presume I'm supposed to turn to you on this one, huh? Town Clerk, Deborah Cabana. I have prepared the warrant for the special election. Uh, the warrant needs to be posted seven days uh, prior to the election, which has been scheduled for January 11, 2005. And I need the council's signatures on the warrant. You have a copy of it in your packet. Do I hear a motion? Move we approve the warrant for the January 11th special municipal election. Is there a second? Second. Then moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilor Chris. I um, am noticing we're planning on having the election rather than being in the gym. Yes, the thank you. School, um, the, the election will be held in room 101. It is across the hallway from the gymnasium, the same side as the, um, as the cafeteria. I think it'll be adequate for this election. So people would go in the same mm -hmm. place they do. Yeah. Councilor Lynn. Are you accepting absentee ballots now for that January? The absentee ballots were prepared today, and I am ready for anyone who would like to vote absentee, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item 79, Special Election Warden. Town Clerk. This is the uh, item that Manager McGovern was referring to. Uh, the clerk is the individual who uh, appoints a warden with the uh, approval of the municipal officers. And uh, because I'm anticipating one, we, we did not budget for this special election. I'm anticipating a smaller voter turnout. I am recommending that you appoint me as a warden for this election. There's no conflict of interest in me doing this. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. 
been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Item number 80-0405 has to do with Riverside Cemetery rules. Um, would you like to introduce this, Ms. Dana? Yes, I would. Thank you. I would like to mention that uh, the three members of the Riverside Memorial Cemetery trustees are here, Frank Levitt, Beverly Brooking, grateful that you were reappointed, Beverly, and Jesse Timberlake. And um, the trustees have been meeting um, on a fairly regular basis. And as you know, I've been here since March of this year. It's hard to believe that it's going on about nine months now. Um, but anyway, in the short period of time that I have been here, um, one of the issues that we have noticed is that there seems to be an increased interest in, in buybacks of cemetery lots that were purchased sometimes as much as 30 years ago. I've attached to the agenda item the third page, basically summarizing the burials and the lot purchases, um, the amount that we've had, the years they actually had taken place, and um, even more interesting is the uh, price for each of those. But if you look at the, uh, the second half of the list, you'll notice that when we acquired the uh, cemetery in 1945, I believe, um, it says 1949, but I think we acquired it in 45, we started selling the lots for $50 a lot. And I didn't actually get the numbers there, but you can see as, as the years go by that the lots increase $75, $100, 125 150 We have already had some buybacks where folks paid $100, $150 for these lots. And the current policy that was established in 1989 uh, stated that the lots would be bought back at 75% of the current market value. That currently is $600, 75% is $450. So if somebody held on to one of these lots, originally purchased them for $150, which we have a pending request currently, um, they bought three lots, $150 each. They paid $450. At the current policy, we would pay them $1,350 to acquire those lots back. The thing to remember is when people purchase these lots, they're not actually purchasing property. They're purchasing the right of a burial. We still own the cemetery. And we have been maintaining the cemetery. Um, we've been mowing the cemetery. Um, we have a gentleman, uh, John Hartley, who goes out and visits with folks when they select a lot. Um, I do the deeds. We keep the book work, um, so, and then we also have um, a couple of gentlemen from Public Work who are budgeted. Currently, um, the purchase of the lots and the burials is not sustaining the budget. So in looking at this, um, in 1989, when this policy was established, uh, the new part of the cemetery had not yet become available. It was still being developed. And it became, um, the, the members became aware that there were folks who had purchased right property and they were selling them to non-residents and other folks and making a profit on it. So the trustees looked at that in 1989 when the purchase price of lots was $300 and said, we will pay 75% to uh, the, the folks to acquire those lots back. There was a shortage of lots. We wanted to get those lots back. That policy seemed to be fine at that time. Also, uh, even though the deeds had said that the lots were non-transferable, um, there, there was an intent to reinforce in the policy also that people who purchased the rights of the lots could not turn around and sell them to other people. 
the option was that the town could reacquire the lot back. So what we're proposing here tonight is that if there is an intention of people who own property, uh, own the rights on the cemetery lot, that they would like the town to acquire it back, that we will pay them what they purchased for the lot. We've maintained the property. Um, you know, there's, there's been an expense to the municipality to um, let them hold on to those. Um, then in 2000, I believe in 2000, 1999 up until 2003, the price of the lots was $500. Currently it is $600. So there's also a factor in there that we would pay no more than 75% of the current market value. And so I have a, um, a proposed change to the, to the policy. <coughs> and this policy was how, how we started with it, how I started with it when I came here to Cape Elizabeth. Having a fresh pair of eyes look at it, um, Chairman Swift Theata pointed out that the, the last paragraph seemed to be a little bit confusing. And um, after looking at it again, I, I agreed with her. Initially, the policy had said the town may purchase two or more contiguous unused lots from an owner who no longer requires a space. Period. Purchase of a single lot is subject to the approval of the Board of Trustees. And her question to me was, who approves the two or more contiguous lots? That's always been the Board of Trustees. And so we didn't want it to be confusing and put that into one sentence. And then the very last sentence, uh, so the sale of lots to any other person or entity is prohibited it almost appeared that the town couldn't sell the lot. So I gave you a draft um, which basically says the same thing that the trustees have understood all along with regards to the policy. Just, just changing the first part of the last paragraph to say sale of lots by the owner to any other person or entity is prohibited. It's just reinforcing what is in the deed that they get when they purchase the right to burial. However, the town may purchase unused lots from an owner who no longer requires the space subject to the approval of the Board of Trustees. The price paid by the town will be the original price paid to the town for the lot, but no more than 75% of the current selling price of the lots in the cemetery. So moved. <laughs> it's, it's been moved. Do we hear a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I have no a privilege. Question for hmm. Deborah. Um, Deborah, on the deeds from 1989 forward, do those deeds reference the current resale policy? No. Not at all. No. But they're silent. No. They do not. It does not reference it. Is it. Do they say anything about resale no. or sale back? So the current deeds from 89 going forward are all silent on this issue? The current... Is handled only in this policy? Yes. Okay. The current deeds, um, it's, it's to the individual who purchased it or their heirs. And so if, if somebody purchases a lot, they can assign a lot to their heirs, um, but they were not transferable. And and the previous deeds stated that, and the current deeds do, and the current deeds do not reference the buyback policy. Any other questions? Councilor Bassett. I hate to have you feel like you're being ganged up on this by two lawyers at this end. I'm, I'm a recovering lawyer, so it's only one lawyer I want the record to be clear. <laughs> The memo that we have as part of our packet says that deeds, in, in the first paragraph, it refers to deed language that says that um, the deeds were granted to 
the purchaser their heirs and assign, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than what you just said to Councilor Lynch about it being to the purchaser or their heirs. If the deed, in fact, refers to the grantee, their heirs, and assigns, that suggests that a person has the ability to assign their right to transfer it to whomever they want. And we do have some forms where people have, have done that, but they don't have a right to sell their, their um, right. And, and the deed says that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. If my concern is, is that if, he, if somebody has a deed that says that they have the ability to transfer it to their heirs or assigns, assigns is much broader than their heirs. It means to anybody they choose to assign it. And I don't, I mean, unless the deed also references the fact that the deed is subject to rules and regulations of the Riverside Memorial Cemetery as they may exist from time to time, I'd be concerned about creating a policy now after the fact telling people that they can't transfer something that was transferable when they bought it. Councilor Basser, the manager. Yeah, if I could answer the question. question on a sign. Uh, with the operation of a cemetery, uh, what happens is a single member of the family buys the, the right to be, the rights for that particular cemetery lot. Uh, you then have, for example, in my own family, you know, my grandparents bought a lot. Uh, that then passed to my uncle as the heir. Well, his brother died a couple of weeks ago. He had to assign the right to his brother, even though he wasn't an heir, to be buried in that lot, as well as to, to my uncle's wife and, you know, perhaps other members of the family. I, I didn't ask the question. But, it, you know, it, you do need to leave the, the right there for them to assign within the family. That's, that's typically done with cemetery lot. I, I, un I do understand your, your point, Councilor Backer. Uh, you know, with the administration of this policy, you know, we have never had an issue uh, with, you know, folks still like to control who's buried next to them. Or, you know, they do want to give us back the lot. Really, you know, m maybe we could have a lawyer look at this thing and, you know, we could join the cemetery association and spend a lot of, of money doing it. We've never seen the need to do that up to this point. But, you know, this, what, would, what the trustees have tried to do here in Deborah is really address the fact that we're, we're losing a ton of, uh, you know, we're paying out a ton of money when we don't need to be doing it. And, you know, we, we would like to stop that practice uh, as soon as possible. And I think, you know, when Mary Ann pointed out, we look carefully at the existing deeds to make sure there's nothing actually in them that, pro you know, that, that gave them any right uh, you know, above and beyond what the traditional right has been with assigned. And I agree a good lawyer might come in and say, well, I can assign this to anyone. But, you know, we, we then have other rights to, of denial and other issues uh, that folks would be, you know, maybe feel very uncomfortable at the time of burial. Uh, when, uh, you know, people tend, when they're dealing with cemetery lots, to make sure that things are, are set up fine and they're not going to sell someone a lot with a questionable title. Councilor but I, I understand what you are. A strict lawyer might say that this is questionable, but most folks uh, don't try to take advantage of people during this time. Councilor Moles is next. I have two quick questions. The first one, while we were discussing this, do we have a copy of a blank deed up in the office that we might pass around to look at? And the, uh, the other question was um, a little off subject, but when you go to sell a lot, when, when the cemetery decides to sell a lot, what is the uh, requirement? Do you have to have lived in the town for so many, is it 10 years, or, or just moved to town last week, or what, what is it? It's actually stated in the first paragraph of the information that I gave to you. Lots of souls are citizens of Cape Elizabeth or non-resident taxpayers. And then it goes on to say that it's restricted to four lots unless there's approval by the Board of Trustees. 
I, I had thought that there was a time, but there isn't a time for them to make mm -hmm. more than so okay. You're lucky enough to die here. <laughs> you're lucky enough to stay here. <laughs> Any further? I'm sorry. Not <laughs> you, Jack. I had two questions. Uh, one, do unused lots ever revert to the town? Say they've been unused for 100 years. Are they going to remain vacant forever when there is the premium for the hill lot? Or can the town claim them at this particular time? And the other one, if people say purchase a lot, a, a, a group of four, with respect, whatever they have, they have a large family. Family members move to California, they no longer want to see them. Are going to be buried in Cape Elizabeth? Uh, some people do leave here and get buried elsewhere. Uh, but has the town ever made an effort, perhaps, to ask people uh, if they are no longer going to use those lots, if they would transfer a title to the town for the use of residents that perhaps can't afford their own lots? There actually is a statute. I'm learning more about cemeteries than I ever hoped to. <laughs> Uh, but there is, we've only owned the cemetery since 1945. Uh, there is a statute that says if, if a lot has not been used, if it's been owned and not used after 75 years, then the town can seek uh, to purchase that lot back. Um, because it's not 75 years, I really haven't given a whole lot of attention <laughs> to that section of the statute. Um, so I know that there is a provision and there's a mechanism where you have to look for the heirs and, and make sure that there's no one that has claim to it and the town can acquire that back. My second question would be then, if there's like a single lot remaining in a family that maybe at some point we could uh, promote uh, donating those particular lots to, to the town for, for use of other, other people at no cost. So I, I do lot. think um, just looking back in some of the general assistant files um, before I came, that that provision was made for an applicant. Okay. Any further comments? Um, Councilman? Back to my other question before, was, was there anyone that wanted to see a blank deed before we voted on this, or are you satisfied with the language that's coming on the deed? I'm satisfied okay. if the deed was silent. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't doing something that added confusion. And I'm satisfied that what uh, Deborah and the trustees have proposed brings clarity rather than confusion. OK. I think we'll move the question then. All in favor uh, of the, uh, well, wait a minute. Have we had a motion? Yes. And I'm sorry. Seconded. And it was the motion with this, the proposed language the on the, the new, newer language. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. And I want to mm -hmm. thank you, thank the trustees of the Riverside Memorial Cemetery for their hard work on this issue and for um, all their efforts on behalf of the town. Thank you. Okay, next item is item number 810405, and could we have the assistant town manager, Deborah Lane, come to the podium and just explain what this is? Good evening, town councilors. Deborah Lane, assistant town manager. At the December council meeting each year, the council views the list of gifts and donations that are provided to the uh, various municipal departments. And in your packet, you should have received uh, the various gifts. Um, as always, we have extremely uh, generous folks, both residents and non-residents, given to various departments in the community. And we would encourage you to uh, approve these donations as they are listed before you. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. And moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or any questions for Ms. Lane? Councilor Lynch? Uh, just a discussion. I, I thought it would be important to point out that we are accepting 
$626 in gifts um, primarily, although as I, it looks to me, it's not entirely Cape residents, but almost all uh, town residents uh, donating $91,000 to a variety of causes. So I want to thank those people um, for their generosity to the playground, the library, the rescue team, and the other objects of their charity. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. And I think we all join Councillor Lynch in thanking these very, very generous people who have made gifts and donations to the town as, um, with money. And there were some in that were um, gifts in kind. And uh, we know from our previous appointments committee um, recommendations how many people devote their energy and their time to the town. So this is a night when we celebrate the generosity of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lane. Next on our agenda is item number 82, the Fort William Park Forestry Report. Would you like to say anything about this, Mr. McGovern? I'd just like to thank the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for really excellent stewardship of the trees and the other plantings at, at Fort Williams Park. Uh, they, uh, as part of their capital program this year, they had this report done, and it, it really looks at all the trees, and there's some very serious issues with, I call it kudzu, but I, the report gives it another name of those creepy crawler things that cut <laughs> up the trees. And, you know, if you're not careful, those choke down trees, and last spring, Public Works went in and took a lot of that down up in front of the former Goddard home, which they now call the Goddard Mansion. Uh, and uh, it was controversial at the time, but this report points out if you don't go in and get all that vine stuff out of there, it chokes the trees. So uh, I'm really pleased that, that the Fort Williams Commission has really looked at this, looked at the issues, and uh, you know, it would be a great resource for them in the future. So uh, you had just had the cover. Yeah, you got the report early. We just gave you the cover and the thing. So I would encourage the council to acknowledge receipt and to thank the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? Well, those, those vining things are bittersweet, and they're well, they it's, it's, it's all over town. It's just a really, you know, problem in ways to explain. So. Do I hear a motion? Um, move that we acknowledge receipt of the report. Okay. Second. Second. And moved and seconded. Any further discussion or comments? Okay. All in favor? Six zero. Thank you very much. And I too would like to, on behalf of the council, thank the Fort Williams Advisory Commission um, for their hard work on this report, as well as the people at OST Associates. Um, the work they do will be a great plan, a great planning guide for the future. Thank you. Um, item number 83-0405, the town manager, excuse <coughs> me, speak. <coughs> Thank you, Ann. Uh, <coughs> the main legislature at their last session last year uh, delegated to the uh, public, Maine Public Utilities Commission uh, responsibility to uh, attempt to reduce the numbers of public safety answering points in the state of Maine from 48 to between 16 and 24. Uh, the PUC is now in, in the middle of this inquiry. Uh, they've conducted uh, public meetings across the state. Uh, and it was interesting, look, you know, looking at the legislation, it was clear that when they first looked at this, that they looked at the county as a model. With, you know, I think that's where the number 16, and then looking in addition to that, perhaps putting uh, the, uh, the state police and the city of Portland and a few other things. Uh, we'd had some discussions earlier with South Portland about doing one with them. Uh, we have, we've had renewed discussions with Scarborough uh, and South Portland. This is not, at this point, the full dispatching. This is simply the 911 call and where that comes in. 
the manager's chief of police and fire chief of the three communities, uh, Scarborough, South Fulton, Cape, uh, got together and unanimously agreed that, that as Ed Guggen, the chief in South Portland, said, we, we all like playing in the same sandbox together. Uh, we don't want to be put in, in someone else's sandbox uh, or to be told which sandbox we're going to be playing in. Uh, and, you know, I think it's refreshing. Jeff Jordan, the manager in South Portland, put together a list that you have here of all the different things that the three communities do together, and it's rather remarkable uh, all the examples of cooperation when there's this hint that we're not doing a regionalism, you read this thing Jeff prepared, and it shows, you know, we, we're working together really at most every opportunity. Uh, so anyway, uh, there was a deadline that we had to send something to the PUC, so we, we did all actually sign this letter and said that we hoped that they'd look favorably upon putting the three of us together as, as partners, and uh, they, the PUC was extremely impressed with, with what the three communities had done. Uh, the, the chief uh, in particular, uh, because every place else they're going, you hear, oh, we can't, we can't join, we can't combine. They mentioned one small coastal town in, in southern Maine uh, with some presidential visitors from time to time uh, who said that they absolutely needed to maintain their single PTAP. And this place had stored uh, public safety calls in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, so anyway, uh, I just wanted to update you on this, see if there are any questions, make sure that staff wasn't too far out in front of the council on this issue, and also indicate that we're continuing discussions with the three communities, among the three communities, I should say, uh, on the entire dispatch function. Uh, because the thing about a PSAP is you call 911 and, you know, say it goes to this center, this, let's decide, let's say we put it in Cape Elizabeth, which isn't too likely, but say it goes into Cape Elizabeth. The, uh, the phone rings there, and then if, if the three dispatch centers in three communities, you need to then transfer the call somewhere else. So while the state saves money on all the 911, uh, really all you've done is added more staff. And you know, and even by just doing the PSAP alone, it's gonna cost us more money than it is currently, because we're going to have to be paying conceivably one of the other two communities to simply answer the 911 calls for us and transfer elsewhere. Uh, you know, it, it's rather crazy, but the state has determined, the legislature has determined that, that regionalism is the way to go. And, uh, you know, because, you know, this past year they took a million dollars away from this fund to fund things other than what we're paying for in our telephone bills. Uh, because, you know, they complain it's costing too much money, but yet they managed to take a million dollars away from the fund. Well, I'll, I'll get off that case. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, <coughs> I'll shut up and uh, <laughs> see if you have any questions. Are there I, I'm, I'm getting carried away. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mike. Are there questions for the manager? Councilor Frick. So I'm wondering if, if there would be any change, like say, as I understand now, if you dial 911 on a cell phone, it goes from home. If state we, police. State police. State police. So then if we had these three communities become a PSAP, <coughs> would those cell phone calls come to this area if they were located here, or it doesn't make sense? They're working now at changing the technology and putting in a new system. In fact, it's been mandated by the, the Federal Communications Commission that, that cell phones, you know, that they need to design new cell phones and the, the devices and the towers to direct it to the nearest uh, public safety network. It's not in place yet, but it is a directive of the Federal Communications Commission. Any more questions? Councilor Lynch? I'm just glad to hear the manager say that there is some discussion of merging or discussions of how we can economize on the dispatch. Um, I know we looked at that issue earlier this year. We probably all had different reasons for um, not wanting it. Um, I, for one, thought that in light of a pending tax cap, um, we ought not to be doing things in a piecemeal basis, but we have the lefty proposal behind us, um, and I, I think it is incumbent upon us to, particularly if, as you say, this would actually cost us more, <laughs> then it is incumbent upon us to see what economies are out there, including the merger or the dispatch. So 
I'm glad that those are at least those issues are being explore, explored at the staff level. Is it, if I might agree for something, I put this item on the agenda to have a little bit of discussion on it uh, with the hope that there might be some. Ron Owens, the, the manager in Scarborough, Favreau, has, has, he works with Deb and uh, Neil got him some numbers as well. They're looking, they're doing spreadsheets looking at the cost of combining all the dispatch and the last, uh, he makes certain assumptions which I'm not sure I, I agree with necessarily because uh, you know, a lot of this would be subject to negotiation. But he showed up saving, I think it was about $120,000, $114,000, $120,000. Uh, excuse of what me, we uh, now spend, uh, Cape, Elizabeth. Cape Elizabeth, of what we now spend <coughs> on dispatching. However, uh, what he didn't look at at all is, you know, the issue we always look at is that we would then have a police station with, with no receptionist, with no one to do clerical work and some of those other issues. So, you know, it, it just shows me that, you know, in the end, when we look at dispatching, as, as we expect, the savings are going to be negligible. I think, with, 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 although there could be slight savings. <coughs> However, the real issue is, you know, and I, I was called to dispatch the other day for something, and he had a couple of calls coming in at the same time and didn't, even, didn't have time to say hello to me, uh, which, which is fine. I, I, the other calls were more important. Uh, but, you know, the advantage of a regional dispatch is, is that when you do have two or three, four or five calls come in, you have more dispatches to handle them. You can also have dispatches that, that have a higher level of training as, in, as emergency medical dispatches. Uh, and, you know, what we really need to balance off of those issues versus, you know, the loss of the local feel, the local knowledge. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think in the end when the council is, will be making this decision, those are the issues. It's not going to be so much dollars as it is, you know, is it a better level of service uh, regionally by having the backup, by having the specialization versus the current system? And it, it's, it's a close call. Further comments? Okay, thank you very much, Mike. We'll move on. Next item, item number 84, which is a report from the town attorney with regard to town-owned lots. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ann. I should have mentioned at the beginning of the meeting the, the manager's report. I sent an email to the council today, and I don't know if you've all seen it, but we do have one <coughs> fewer, one less town owned lot uh, than we did at the beginning of the day. The lot in back of me, the former service station, uh, we actually had the closing on that today. Uh, so that is now owned by ISIS Development and, and not by the town of Cape Elizabeth. And we received the proceeds from that today. So I'd like to thank uh, Paul Wood, the, the President of that, that uh, limited liability corporation for his efforts, as well as Tom Leahy, who uh, worked very hard on that uh, over a long time to see it come to conclusion. So I'm pleased about that. Uh, as you know, the council also, as, as one of its, I think it came out as one of its goals this year, but certainly as part of the budget, was to look at uh, all of the town owned lots to see if maybe there's others that we don't need. Uh, and you, you had a, we've had a couple of workshops on this. Uh, you, you had narrowed it down to uh, you know, about a dozen or so lots uh, earlier. And at that point, we said, well, we, we better stop for a minute and do a little bit of title work uh, to see if, in fact, if, if, if there's anything in the provisions that would prohibit us from selling that. And let me briefly go over what the town attorney uh, found. Uh, there are a couple of lots on Ocean View Road that are essentially free and clear to sell, uh, although they might have some issues involving their value being affected by uh, the possible uh, abandonment of Paper Streets at the same time, vacation of Paper Streets. Uh, but again, those, those look like they, they could be sold. Uh, an interesting one, lot U3212 on Mitchell Road. This is directly across from uh, Columbus Road, not on Columbus Road, but across Mitchell and Columbus Road. Uh, there's a nearby wetland, and I spent quite a bit of time with, uh, uh, particularly with Matt Sturgis today, on this lot. And it, it is close to the wetland next to it. Uh, what we need to do is go out and get some more uh, uh, work done on the wetland and the setback issue and determine a building envelope. What I'd like to do with that one is continue on on this list 
but to see if, in fact, we can get a decent building envelope on that property. Because if we can, that property, he believes, is, could be sold in excess of $100,000 for an approximately 12,000 square foot lot. Uh, it would be a, a beautiful place to have a home. So, uh, and there's a lot of folks looking for single, uh, single lot. Uh, although, you know, we do need to do that, and we will. Uh, Pell Street is uh, down off the, the, the corner of uh, Berwick Avenue, right near the South Portland line. Uh, a lot of other developments going in, in that neighborhood. There's a lot of interest in uh, the lots down there. Of the four that are down there, two of them could be, could be sold. And what's really unique about those is that they, their sales could allow some development to occur out in the back of that area. So they do have, they do have value uh, to the folks who wish to develop that property. There are there's some of the folks that have interest in that property in back, they have also just recently bought a, a home on Kildare Road uh, so that they could potentially get access from Kildare Road. So it's inevitably inevitable that that land back there is going to be developed by property acquisitions. And the issue is, does the town want to take advantage of its ownership right uh, to uh, try to get some funds uh, for that lot. Uh, on Stony Brook Road, this is one we, we sort of had off the list again, but at the end threw it back on the list because it was complicated paper trees, but it, you, you can read the, the information, it looks pretty good there. Uh, the lots recommend not be sold. Uh, there's a tiny lot on McKinney Point Road and one on Alewife Brook Road. These are both wet have little value, have other encumbrances, but they also have some vague references to shore rights. And for what little we could get for them now, because they're not buildable, they're wet, I would just think that for posterity purposes, we ought not to uh, extinguish any shore rights that we may have by trying to, to have a short-term gain at this point in time, particularly when we apparently have other opportunities for short-term gain. Uh, South Street, there were two more lots that are not marketable, as the town attorney explained. And then there's, there's a lot over in the back of the gravel pit uh, owned by the Murrays on Fowler Road. There's a, out of that property, there's a tuning fork-shaped car seat as part of that. What we found, what the town attorney found, was that that was originally a wood lot owned by some Hannafords, and it, it eventually went to a Marion Hannaford and there's a Marion B. Hannaford, there's a Marion S. Hannaford, and, and there's actually someone down in that area who, who spoke to me interested in acquiring what part of the home, part of the tuning fork. Uh, I would, you know, I don't want to get involved or have the town get involved at this point in researching Marion Hannaford and who she is and who, who, her, 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 who her is might be, but we can, we can give this to anyone who's interested and encourage them to do that work. Uh, to see if maybe that one could, could come back on the block. So what I'd like to do is to uh, recommend uh, that you, we continue uh, planning for the possible disposition of the lots indicated on Ocean View Road, the lot on Mitchell, the ones on South, and the one on Stony Brook Road uh, at this time. And what that means is that probably at an executive session at the January meeting, because I don't think we ought to be publicly discussing prices, uh, come back to you and discuss, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's because of disposition of real estate, here's a committed private discussion uh, under the right to know law, is have a discussion on exactly the amount that, that these perhaps should be uh, marketed for. Thank you very much. For and I really want to thank Tom Leahy <coughs> and uh, uh, his paralegal, uh, Audrey uh, Knight, uh, for all of uh, her work in. Thank you. I knew Audrey when she bought a field. I had to check the last name. <laughs> the the last. Thank you, Mike. Um, do I hear a motion from Council? Mm -hmm. I think what I'm asking is this to be tabled to the January meeting. It's an easier way of doing it. I move that we table <laughs> item 8404. 05 to the January meeting. Second. Well, there is no discussion on motion to table. So all in favor of tabling it to the January meeting? Signify. 
I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Is that everybody? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, <clears throat> now it's the second period we have during our agenda for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who would like to come forward and speak? Seeing no one, um, I would like to hear a motion to adjourn. However, I just want to remind everyone the January meeting is on Wednesday and not on Monday. It will be the day after the special municipal election with the, the desire that the new councillor elected on January 11th would be seated on that evening. Also, at your workshop on uh, January 4th, uh, the town clerk will be present to uh, ask all of the councillors that evening, as well as the school board members, to take a new oath as council members because all of your previous oaths were based on your terms expiring in May, and you now need to do new documents with the with your new extended terms that extend to December. And if you don't do that? Uh, you, need to do that. <laughs> you need to do that. I just, before we adjourn, I would just like to remind everyone to please get Mike uh, McGovern any date conflicts that you have on these two dates. Mike Holmes, please. I just wanted to say I'm sure the rest of the town council and town staff would join me in wishing all of our residents a very happy and safe holiday season and uh, so that we'll see you all again in January. Great. Thank you very much. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.